Hi, everyone. Welcome today to today's session. I'm Kelly Finn Stormer, the executive director of the Combined Arms Institute, and I will be your host uh, for today's session on financial management for veteran nonprofits. Uh, we're excited about this conversation, and it came to, to be in a, a bit of a unique way. Um, but as I was reading an article, uh, that's I always love articles that sort of buck the norms in terms of its subjects about charities that don't embrace common financial norms tend to outperform their peers in the Chronicle of Philanthropy article. And so this piqued my interest in terms of, well, if we don't play by the rules, uh, what does that mean for us? And how do we outperform our peers? Aren't we all interested in that sort of thing? And as we as a veteran serving community are thinking about this, you know, American interest waning and in veterans and military issues, our second consecutive quarterly decline of the GDP with our pending, are we in a recession? Are we not in a recession conversation that's happening on the daily? It's going to be really important to think about how we can continue to grow and invest in our missions so that we can serve veterans and families each and every day. So like I said, I welcome you. Thank you for joining us. We'd love to hear who you, where you're from and uh, put, if you could put your name and location in the chat. I know we have several people from Baruch College joining us today as well. And so we welcome you. Um, thank you for taking a minute to invest a little bit in this time. If you'll go to the next slide, please. Um, in 2013, Dan Pallotta gave a famous TED talk about the way we think about charity is dead wrong. I love this TED Talk. If you haven't seen it, it's worth 18 minutes of your time to, to invest um, in listening to just kind of what he was saying, what he's saying. And I think our conversation today is really going to expand upon that um, to talk about how do we think differently when it comes to veteran financial management? How do we talk to our investors and donors and partners about that? And certainly, how do we engage our board in this conversation as well? Um, so some of the research that the, our panelists are going to share with us today are that two-thirds of charities that file tax returns um, have budgets less than $500,000, um, and that's a significant portion. So that's one-third are making $500,000 or more, one-third of nonprofits. Um, and charities that don't embrace norms um, spend 53% more money to advance their mission over a 10-year period. In a lot of ways, right? So Dan Pallotta talked about this rule book. There's one rule book for the for-profit sector and the other for the nonprofit sector. And we have to decide where we're gonna live. So right, he, the question he says is, we can either do well for yourself and your family, or you can do good for the world. And we have to make that choice because traditional nonprofit standards, right? They tell us, not to put money into compensation, not to invest in advertising and marketing, make sure you have low overhead, make sure you're not investing in too much risk. Um, you know, and certainly about the time that we are given to be allowed to grow. If your uh, balance sheet is upside down, you know, the, they're gonna have some serious conversations in those board meetings that you're having. And so the question we're here to talk about today is does traditional financial management prohibit or inhibit growth. Um, and I'm excited to really have this conversation with you all and to, to be able to lead this conversation so that we can think more and strategically about this um, in terms of what might be good for growth. We do have an obligation to show that we are trustworthy. Uh, we wanna make sure that organizations are not using funding for fraud. Um, we wanna make sure, but the question is, is like, can we think beyond traditional nonprofit norms, which is pay low, spend it all, volunteer labor. How do we invest in sustain our mission and our teams um, beyond what is the traditional norms? At Combined Arms, we're always talking about thinking about our organization and holding ourselves to standards as if we were running a for-profit business with a tax advantage. We want to make sure that we're doing the best that we can with every donor dollar um, and so we want to encourage our partners and, and others to do exactly the same. So I'm thrilled to welcome, if you go to the next slide, please, our pan we have several panelists that are joining us with us today. And I will say this conversation started by me reading the article, 
And then I emailed uh, George and I said uh, with a subject line of this is blasphemy, right? Like this is not what we are taught here. And um, so he's going to talk to us a little bit more um, with uh, his research partners about this. So I'd like to welcome George, Thad, and Dennis to the conversation. Um, we're excited to have you with us today. Um, both George and Thad are partners, and they recently wrote research on the pro proverbs of non non nonprofit financial management and the hidden cost of trustworthiness. If you'll go to the next slide, please. Um, George Mitchell is an associate professor at the Marx School of Public and International Affairs at Baruch College, City University of New York, and is the director of Marx School's Center for Nonprofit Strategy and Management. Before joining the Marx School, he was an assistant professor at the Colin Powell School at the City College of New York and co-founder of the transnational NGO initiative at the Maxwell School of Syracuse University. His research examines topics in the NGO and nonprofit management, leadership and strategy, and appears in various journals, nonprofit studies, and international relations. He serves on the editorial board of nonprofit management and leadership and the American Review of Public Administration. His co-authored book, Between Power and Irrelevance, The Future of Transnational NGOs, is available from the Oxford University Press. If you go to the next slide, please. Our next panelist, Thad Calabrese, his research is teaching focus broadly on applying financial management theories and techniques to organizations engaged in providing public services in the public and not-for-profit sectors. He's an active researcher and his work has appeared in academic journals such as the Journal of Accounting and Public Policy, Public Administration Review, Nonprofit and Quarterly Sector, and so many more. In addition to his academic work, he has many um, published in public policy research reports and was awarded the Editor's Prize for the best scholarly paper in nonprofit management and leadership. He currently serves on the editorial boards for the Journal of Public Administration Research and Theory and the Public Budgeting and Financing as well. Um, he is the immediate past treasurer for the Association for Research on Nonprofit and Voluntary Action, ARNOVA, and served as the elected chair for the Association for Budgeting and Financial Management. So he, guys, he knows what he's talking about here. Um, Thad previously served um, in the New York City Office of Management and Budget and Tax Policy and as a financial consultant working with nonprofit organizations in New York City. So welcome, Thad. And then finally, certainly last but not least, we have Dennis Young with us. He's a professor emeritus at Georgia State University in the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences at Case Western Reserve University. Um, in 2016 and 17, he was executive in residence at the Maxine Goodman Levin College of Urban Affairs at Cleveland State University, and previously was a professor of public management and policy in the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies where he directed GSU's nonprofit studies program. Um, he are, we have many, has written many books, um, one of which we're gonna be sharing and talking about with you today. Um, and in 2004, he received Arnova's Award for Distinguished Achievement and Leadership in Nonprofit in the Voluntary Action Research, the Award for Innovation in Nonprofit Research from the Israeli Center for Third Sector Research um, and many other amazing awards. And so our distinguished panelists, we are so grateful for you joining us today. If you'd like to join me on camera, um, we invite you to come and tell us a little bit more about your research and how we can be thinking about this as nonprofit leaders in this space. So thank you, Dennis, Thad, and George. We welcome you. Great. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we appreciate your time and uh, joining us for the webinar today. I think we've all been pretty thoroughly introduced, so I think we can kind of just jump right into the talk here. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, many years ago, I'd been you know, following the nonprofit management research in academia on financial management uh, norms. And it seemed to me that there was a lot of research really causing me to re-examine the conventional wisdoms about how we're approaching nonprofit financial management as a sector. It seemed to me that a lot of managers are adopting what I think of as a normative approach to financial management, where they're following rules of thumb and what they think are best practices that have kind of been handed down to them or just are part of our culture as a sector. 
Uh, and sometimes that I, I feared could come at the expense of a strategic management approach focused more on maximizing organizational mission impact. And there are examples uh, I'm sure many of us could point to maybe in the Q&A where the pressure to follow some of these norms has inhibited the ability of organizations to make certain investments that uh, might have been uh, productive investments. So the nonprofit sector, trustworthiness is very important. Um, and one way that nonprofits can project trustworthiness to the world is through what we call in our research physical probity signaling or just sort of things like on your website, putting up that pie chart that shows the overhead ratio and that you know 90 cents on the dollar goes toward programs and things like that. And there are different groups like Charity Navigator and Charity Watch that use financial information to assess like the worthiness or trustworthiness of nonprofits. And a lot of this is driven by financial management practices and different financial ratios that are sort of analyzed to produce recommendations and seals of approval. So the question was, <clears throat> um, does this activity of adhering to these financial norms uh, have relationship with organizational impact over time? So we did an empirical project to try to answer this question using some data. Uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> there's this sort of assumption that if you're doing things like minimizing overhead ratios, you have diverse revenue sources, you're financially lean, you're not accumulating excessive levels of financial reserves, you're avoiding debt and so forth. Uh, we all kind of like feel in our guts a little bit in the sector that these are good financial management practices. But if you look at the research, there's actually not much there or, or very little to nothing there, really substantiating that these are good practices nonprofit organizations throughout the sector. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Thad, do you want to run us through uh, these individual norms and then we'll come back around? Sure. So let me pick up where George left off. So um, when when we started talking about what some of these norms were, we we um, we developed these four for for our uh, proverbs paper. Um, uh, which which is available uh, as an open access uh, uh, academic paper. Um, when I'm not speaking, I'll I'll find it and put it in the chat. Um, these these are not uh, these are not intended to be the only norms, but these were the these were some that George and I thought were the most relevant given our experiences in the, in the sector. So as George already mentioned, uh, perhaps the most pervasive norm in the nonprofit sector is that overhead spending is wasteful money um, because it diverts funds away from the mission of the organization. And, and yet when we, um, when we look at the, the research, the academic research, the empirical work, um, there's you know, the first, the first uh, um, sort of argument against that norm is that um, the originally overhead was viewed as um, it was it, the, the overhead ratio was 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 intended to be uh, some sort of efficiency measure, but but it's it's not an efficiency measure. It it, it simply measures spending on overhead uh, as a ratio of total spending. So it's not an inputs to outputs measurement. It's really just a fraction of the inputs uh, to total inputs. Um, it's also had a, a deleterious effect, as I'm sure many people know, in that nonprofits underinvest in um, needed organizational infrastructure, such as information technology, financial management systems, et cetera. Um, and, um, and, and so there's, there's a real cost to minimizing overhead. Um, so in our research, we, we look at some of the standard measures used uh, in, in the, uh, as, as George mentioned, some of the evaluators the administrative expense ratio and the fundraising expense ratio, which looks at those functional spending categories as a, as a fraction of total spending. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another common uh, proverb of nonprofit financial management is the belief that uh, more revenue streams uh, are, are necessary to improve the, the fiscal health of the organization. Um, fundamentally, this is an idea that is derived from portfolio theory. Um, when Dennis speaks later on, he is going to he he was 
the developer of uh, benefits theory, which, which is arguably um, a much better uh, approach to determining uh, sufficient and adequate revenue sources for not-for-profit organizations. But portfolio theory defaults to the position that more revenue streams is always better. However, there's some empirical research that's been done that actually shows um, the more concentrated your revenue sources are, um, you may actually have uh, uh, faster growth in, in, the, in your nonprofit organization that you can run a, a administratively leaner organization because you, you, have, you don't need as many managers doing different things. You have, uh, you have some economies of scale in your, uh, in your uh, administration of organization. And further, there's been other research that has shown that the types of revenue diversification you seek is, is perhaps more important than simply diversifying your revenues um, overall. Um, so in our empirical section, which we will get to, we, we use a, a hirschman herfindahl index, which is a commonly used measure of uh, revenue concentration um, it, it, it is also used, if you're familiar with that measure, it is used to measure um, business concentration in, in monopoly and antitrust cases, but we are using it here to measure revenue sources, uh, a, a, a diversity of revenue sources. Um, next slide, please. Uh, another another uh, norm, as George alluded to earlier, was the idea that nonprofits ought to not be profitable. Um, that the term nonprofit means that you should have no profits, um, that you should have little to no reserves um, that would you would be able to use during routine business cycles, um, that, that having high profitability or excessive reserves uh, makes you uh, appear too commercial, that it looks like you're hoarding resources instead of devoting your resources to charitable output. Um, there is some research that, that shows um, that, that having resources available in, in the form of reserves uh, allows nonprofits to maintain charitable output during normal routine business cycles, meaning the normal ups and downs of the economy. Um, there's also some research that shows nonprofits, because of this norm, hide their reserves or even hide uh, their profitability by manipulating their financial results. So there's also an issue that this norm leads to a lower uh, amount of transparency with nonprofit organizations. Uh, we measure here the uh, profit margin, which is a flow measure of annual profits, um, total profits over total revenues. And we also look at the years of net assets, uh, which is a stock measure of the amount of wealth nonprofits have accumulated in the organization. Uh, next slide, please. And the final one, and again, not to imply that these are the only norms, but these are the norms we looked at. Um, we looked at the, the notion that nonprofits ought to avoid debt, that donations from, that uh, contributions from donors are intended to fund current services. Uh, donors are less interested in funding past services or don't want their money to basically be used to pay back lenders. Um, debt increases uh, the risk of insolvency and, and threatens the future probability of outputs. However, there's research that shows um, you know, that debt can be a very quick way to effectively capitalize an organization. And nonprofits face a very limited um, um, capital financing market. There, there is effectively no, no equity market. Um, one, some, some will argue that the donations market is, um, is the equity market for nonprofits, but it's hardly efficient um, and it's very costly to enter that market. And so the, 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 uh, the debt market is one of the only uh, um, sources that nonprofits have available to it to, um, to capitalize quickly the organization and perhaps invest in long-term assets that will, that will actually help provide charitable outputs. Um, we use the measure of, um, the, we use the interest expense ratio, which is the ratio of interest to total expenses um, 
which which is is really meant to capture this idea that that um, uh, donors um, may be concerned if most of of the spending is going towards lenders rather than charitable outputs. Um, you can go to the next slide, and I think at this point um, George was going to pick it back up, so I'll I'll, I'll toss it back to George at this point. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Thad. So a lot of these norms in general tend to favor what an economist might refer to as consumption over investment. In other words, current spending on charitable outputs at the expense of growth over time. And that means at the expense also potentially of, uh, you know, uh, a greater ability to serve the mission over time through uh, stronger and quicker growth. So there's an interesting kind of puzzle here, a potential trade-off here, that this imperative to appear to be trustworthy by adhering to these financial management norms could actually harm, potentially, the ability of nonprofits to maximize their impact over time. Uh, next, please. So we, we wanted to test this using some financial data on nonprofit organizations. So we, we built a a large panel of nonprofits going back to the 1980s all the way up through 2019 and focused on nonprofits that receive a majority of their income from donations. And we don't have any good measures for total impact, but we do have measures of total spending. So we use total spending as a, a proxy or as a kind of a standard measure for total impact. And we use an interesting technique to measure what we call norm busting. Uh, which basically means that uh, if a nonprofit exceeds the, the median value within their sector within a year, then norm, they are a norm buster. So in other words, if within your sector within a given year, you know, you're spending more on fundraising than most other organizations, then you're considered a, a norm buster. So we wanted to see, well, what's the actual impact of norm busting on total spending over time and by extension, presumably total impact over time. And this overtime thing is important. A lot of research and thinking in this area is, is very static and just kind of looks at a single year or a couple of years. But a lot of the, the um, decisions nonprofit financial managers make are really decisions that unfold over time. And uh, some represent like investments in future capacity and growth. And so we felt it was important to look at this over uh, not just one or two years, but in our case, a decade. Uh, next, please. So uh, I have some graphs here. I won't spend a lot of time on them, but uh, just quickly so you can get a sense of the importance of that time dimension. On the left here on the y-axis, uh, this is number of years. And on the bottom x-axis there, you have the uh, basically the impact on total spending. And uh, those numbers at the bottom are, are essentially percentages. So 0 0.05 means uh, 5%. So what this shows is for administrative spending, if you're busting the norm, which is to say, if you're spending more than most in your sector in a year on administration in terms of the ratio, uh, after one year, uh, that has a negative effect. And then as you go through two, three, four, you know, year six, seven, eight, and so forth, that negative effect approaches zero. So it is negative, but it diminishes over time. Next, please. This is uh, the effect of busting the norm on the fundraising expense ratio. At year one, the effect of violating this norm is very, very strongly positive. And that effect diminishes over time, never approaching zero, but getting to about uh, you know 4% or something along those lines by year 10. Next, please. This is that measure of concentration that Thad uh, described earlier. The effects here are a little bit more ambiguous, but you can see most of them are positive. And if you add them up, uh, they are indeed positive. So essentially having more concentrated revenue sources than the norm for your sector year on the whole actually uh, has a, a positive effect for organizations according to this. Next, please. Again, years of net assets, as uh, Thad mentioned, this is a, a common although approximation of nonprofit reserves. And uh, of course, if you're saving money, you're not spending money. So you would expect a kind of a negative initial effect, uh, but this effect approaches zero 
after a few years, as you can see here in this pattern. Uh, next, please. Nonprofits are nonprofit, but some can and do make profits. Uh, it's, it's one of the interesting features of our sector that it's sort of named in, in a way that's perhaps a little bit misleading. Uh, but here, the effect of uh, the profit of violating the norm around the profit ratio uh, is very strongly positive, peaking at about five years there. Next, please. And the interest expense ratio is an indicator of uh, essentially debt for nonprofits and the significance of debt for a nonprofit. And you can see here that the effect is very strongly positive uh, initially, and then the strength of that effect diminishes over time, uh, approaching zero uh, after a decade or so. Next, please. So the bottom line to all this is when you add all of these different effects up, and look at the result, uh, you see that uh, norm busting contributes positively uh, to a nonprofit's total spending and therefore presumably impact to the tune of about half or more than half over a 10 year period. And you can see not all of the effects are positive, uh, some are negative, but my thinking about this process is that organizations are either managing their finances in this normative way, or they're managing their finances in a strategic way. And so I think of these practices driven by norms as kind of going together. Uh, next, please. So uh, we titled the paper, uh, this other research paper, The Hidden Cost of Trustworthiness, because the need to appear trustworthy by adhering to these financial norms results in foregone mission impact, and not uh, a small amount, but uh, about half of, of, uh, foregone, of your impact over a 10-year period. There are some important limitations here to the analysis uh, I won't get into here. Of course, there's more detail about this in the paper. It is a sample of mostly larger nonprofits, which is important. And it's also important to note that these results vary quite widely by subsector. So depending on whether you're uh, in the healthcare sector or education sector, arts sector, human services sector, uh, the effect of following these norms is very, very different. So there are no universal rules of thumb here that all nonprofits should follow this norm or that norm. Uh, the data just doesn't support that kind of thinking. Next, please. So it's important for nonprofits to, to be trustworthy, to project trustworthiness, but uh, I think if this is uh, causing on profits to make decisions that might be limiting their mission impact, then organizations and their leadership should have conversations with their board and their supporters to think about uh, the organization's needs and strategies so that this tension is not posing a trade-off. Uh, we don't recommend flouting norms necessarily. Uh, you need to consider your unique situation, obviously, not adhering to some of these norms could draw a lot of negative attention and be problematic for organizations. But uh, you know, if you kind of learn anything from this research, I would say it's that uh, we should not be taking norms for granted as necessarily good advice. Most of them lack a solid empirical foundation. And so you really need to think about your unique situation. Uh, and next slide, please. So this takes us to um, uh, Dennis's part of the presentation here, you might be asking yourself, well, if these norms aren't great advice, what is good advice? How should we be thinking about nonprofit financial management? And this is where Dennis comes in uh, with his uh, paradigm around resilience. So uh, please, Dennis, take it away. Yeah, well, thanks very much. And, uh, you know, I, I think Bad and, and George have done some really pioneering work here. Um, and it, it, it kind of, uh, you know, I can understand where people might Think that it puts us out to sea because we have these norms, but they don't, uh, and it's and it's uncomfortable to think about just throwing the norms away and, and, and trying to you know operate uh, in some un, undefined way. Um, <clears throat> but we don't have what George and and that are saying is a strategic framework for uh, considering or rejecting or substituting. Uh, different norms. 
So the work that I've been doing uh, recently and which is the, you know, came out in, in the form of the book that I co-authored with uh, Elizabeth Searing um, is taking the point of view that nonprofits operate uh, in a very uh, dynamic and, uh, uh, and sometimes traumatic um, environment um, that has partially because they follow these, you know, uh, ad hoc kind of norms and, uh, uh, and rules of thumb um, have uh, gotten a lot of nonprofits into trouble um, that the, the pandemic and, and some previous, uh, you know, uh, crises that we've gone through, such as the financial crisis uh, that impacted nonprofits uh, greatly in 2008, 2009, um, you know, have um, have have really demonstrated that uh, that nonprofits are are fragile and and at risk of uh, really existential uh, threat, and uh, that you know offers I think a basis on which to construct a, a new framework. You know, how should we be managing for nonprofits? Managing nonprofits should they be, you know, simply uh, you know. Uh, austere and efficient like donors would like to see or you know following some of these ideas of to be charitable means you can't make profit and to be charitable means that uh, you know that you can't uh, uh, develop a reasonable uh, overhead we, we need to substitute something for that sort of thinking and in the context of this dy dynamic environment we we frame the idea of managing uh, for resilience and so the question is, how would you, <clears throat> what do you, what do you have to think about in terms of managing a nonprofit so that is, it is resilient, meaning that it would um, perform well over the long term, that it would be, you know, financially and otherwise uh, viable and in a strong position to uh, address its uh, its mission uh, in the in the best possible way. So if we think along those lines, we have to think about risks. What are the risks out there that, that, that may impact nonprofits? What are the probabilities that different kinds of things could happen and what would be the consequences? Uh, we've seen a lot of that documented in the, in the pandemic and you know, we, we could spend a long time on that. Also looking at, at crises as, uh, as opportunities as well as threats. These are, these are chances to look at what we're doing and, and how we could do it better. Um, thinking about um, management in kind of two stages, you know, um, what do we do to prepare for uh, potential uh, challenges and catastrophes even? And then um, hopefully uh, when we actually face those circumstances, what are the things that we have to do to navigate through that? Um, one of the, the really important principles, which goes way back into the uh, literatures in, in, in economics and organization theory, uh, is the notion of um, organizational slack, which sounds like a really bad thing. You know, it sounds like waste, uh, but it's, I think it's key to managing for resilience. It means, um, you know, do you have uh, the kind of reserve capacities? Do you have the kind of redundancies that will allow you to, you know, to navigate through a, through a crisis when uh, when you need that flexibility. Um, so that's tied to. I mean, you can tie that specifically, and I'll go on to another slide where, where I'll show you how that applies. But it will go back. Not yet. <laughs> uh, but I uh, no the previous 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 where yeah right here. I'm not finished with this one yet. <laughs> Whoops. There we go. Um, you know, you, you might be wondering what's this Goldilocks principle and, and in very simple terms, it says, okay, think about organizational slack along a variety of dimensions, financial, technological, in terms of, uh, you know, our network involvement and so forth. Um, you know, how do we think about slack? We just don't want to maximize slack and look wasteful. The Goldilocks principle is that we want it to be just right. We want enough slack so that we can be resilient and well performing over the long term, but we certainly don't want too much so that we're wasting resources. Um, it, alongside this, um, the, this idea is uh, within the resilience framework is the idea that 
you know, said we're in a dynamic environment. We should continually be out to learn how to do better. We should have the, the data systems that will help us do that. We should have uh, an entrepreneurial mindset that looks at uh, the challenges that are faced uh, and, uh, and, and asks how problems can be, uh, can be solved and how uh, new uh, initiatives and, and ideas can be, can be implemented. Um, and so alongside this, part of, part of the data systems would be, you know, do you have, do you, have uh, you know, management uh, reports coming in on a regular basis? Do you have dashboards uh, that will tell you that maybe, you know, things are, are threatening to, uh, to go haywire and we need to do something about it in time? Um, and do you, can you carry out what we call stress tests? Uh, you'll recall that was something very big when we were in the financial crisis and the banks were going under. And so, you know, the government now requires that governments sim that banks simulate what would happen in different conditions and are they going to hold up? Are they going to pass these stress tests? We can create those kinds of stress tests for nonprofits as well so that they start asking the question, well, what if this, what if this happens? Are we capable of getting through it? And what do we have to think about to be, to be stronger? Um, I'm, I'm, conscious of the time, but let's go to the next slide because I want to try to make some of this more specific. Um, on the left side, we've got uh, eight different dimensions along which we can think about uh, resilience management a strategy. And so it's not just financial, but it's it, it, the financial part and the economic part is very important. Um, we balance are looking at our balance sheets is very important and, and thinking about, you know, do we have adequate reserve funds? Indeed, do we have lines of credit? I mean, it, we don't want to just, you know, follow the adage of borrowing is bad. No, actually having access to credit is a very good thing. If you've got a good credit record and you've borrowed um, prudently. So there's the balance sheet strategies. The cost structure strategies are also important. Looking at uh, the nature of the costs that we incur to carry out whatever our particular functions are. And some of those costs we would call fixed costs, that if something happens, we can't do anything about it. I mean, if you're running a nonprofit theater and then the pandemic comes around and you have to close, you still have to you still have to pay your mortgage, your rent, your you know a minimum amount of utilities and so forth, whether or not you have that business. So when you think about structuring your costs over the long term, um, having a balance of those kinds of fixed costs and other kinds of costs that are more flexible and it can be re, you know reduced in in the, in the in the face of uh, financial exigency. That's a very important strategic dimension to look at. Um, we talked about diversification. I think it does, it does have a, a role to play, but we need to, as George mentioned, think about it differently than simply portfolio theory and maximize, you know, becoming as diverse as we possibly can. Um, <clears throat> but we need, to, we need to think about having alternative a revenue stream so that like in the, in, 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 the, um, uh, in the pandemic, uh, a, lot, a lot of nonprofits just lost their earned income stream. They couldn't, people couldn't come in the door and, and obtain their services. And, and so that went out. And so, uh, a, you know, a nonprofit really needed to have uh, a, a donation stream, perhaps a government stream. Diversification is important, but we need to think about it within this framework. Um, I, I, I don't think I, you know, I, these are all chapters in our book and I hope you would read it. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to go the, too far in terms of the timing because we want to talk about these things, but, you know, redundancy in networks and, and the safety nets that we have with uh, relationships with other nonprofits and for-profits, multiple technologies, you know, can we use online services if, for some reason, we can't provide services in person. Um, you know, do we have uh, strategies to deal with uh, our human resources? That's probably the most challenging aspect of, of uh, managing for resilience because you want a flexible workforce that you can possibly adjust uh, to, to the uh, economic challenges, 
On the other hand, you want to maintain um, a, a strong and motivated work workforce, and, and people have to feel that they're just not being discarded because of cost uh, issues. That's it's it's a, it's a whole area that we need to think about in terms of uh, human resources and, and flexibility. And as I mentioned, the information systems before. So, yeah, I I, I think we all agree that. Um, the existing ad hoc set of norms that we've kind of uh, collectively followed in this sector are, are not adequate. They, they can be uh, damaging, um, but we need something else. And, I, and well, what I'm suggesting is that we need to think in terms of the long-term success of nonprofits in a very uh, you know, dynamic environment. And that means that we need to develop these ideas of how do we manage for, uh, for resilience. Um, next slide, I think, is um, just a summary. Uh, the, uh, the environment is, is hard to anticipate and crises are ubiquitous. We need to uh, manage for the survival and long-term effectiveness of nonprofit organizations, not just you know, check the ratio boxes, uh, we need to um, learn, as many nonprofits are learning kind of the hard way, how to manage for resilience um, and find new ways of, uh, you know, thinking. And it involves not only the, the managers of nonprofits and the leaders of nonprofits per se, but as, you know, we've pointed out, it has to do with how funders look at nonprofits and, and, and what they're willing to support and how. Uh, it has to do with regulators and, and what they say is uh, good performance or not good performance. And indeed, you know, just bringing this, this home to, uh, you know, George and Thad and, and myself, um, you know, how do we educate the, 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 genera the future generations of, uh, of, of nonprofit managers? We, we, I think we really kind of need a new way of, of thinking uh, along these lines. So uh, yeah, if you wanna go to the book slide, um, you know, this is all these uh, ideas have been kind of wrapped together in the, this book just out that Elizabeth and I have uh, have uh, produced, and I, and, uh, I think we'll talk to Kelly, talk with Kelly about uh, if you guys want a discount on the book, we'll we'll, we'll try to figure out how to get that. <laughs> We're fans of efficiency. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Maximizing those donor dollars. So if you go to the next slide, please, I think we've got the email addresses, um, which we will include uh, both in the in the follow up for those of you who are all of our registered and participants. Um, if you have questions, um, these obviously these guys are amazing resources and wealth of knowledge. Um, if you go to the next slide, too, I know we always get the question of how do I find this information? We did put some of it in the chat. Um, but if you go to the Combined Arms uh, Institute homepage and just scroll down, you'll see these boxes. Um, we have linked to both all the article um, as well as their research in this library and research bucket. Um, and we will post the, um, the follow up, the, the recording to this um, in the training and webinars section here. So I want to make sure that those resources are readily available for everyone all the time. Um, and then if you'll go just to the next slide um, before we dive in here too, at the end of this, you will get a pop-up on your, um, your screen. If you could just take a quick survey, I'm really grateful always for that key nugget that you learned and take away. Um, it helps us to think about kind of what, we, what we've been able to, to share that's of value. It'll take you literally two minutes. Um, and we're always grateful for you to take the time to do that. So if you do have questions, I see a couple of them coming in in the Q&A section, please just throw them in there for me. And um, if you wanna take the slides down, we'll go ahead and move into this section. And I'm just grateful for you all and your um, experience and research and shared knowledge. I, you know, I, in some ways, I still have to be really honest. Like I find this incredibly frustrating, <laughs> right? And then that we have, this is what we're told to do as a sector, right? Is, um, you know, low salaries, keep your overhead low and, um, what you guys are sharing is that, you know, in not it's not the case for everybody, but like we have to buck these traditional norms and um, and find ways to grow. And in some ways, as as you were speaking, I was thinking about it. Um, 
a little bit about, you know, mother's intuition, you know, like, you know, what's best for your organization and your circumstances. And so you have to be strategic in how you're thinking about that for your individual growth, right? We're talking broad, broadly here. And so um, I think it would be interesting to share, I will say in the research, you guys didn't talk about this, but um, I'm going to pull this statistic out um, from one of your, the papers that you wrote is that between 1977 and 1997, government funds increased from 27% to 37% for all nonprofit revenues, which is the largest area of revenue growth for the sector, um, right? And you all shared a, a much about the, um, you know, importance to focus on one thing and revenue diversification. And so I'm just wondering if your your research or, you know, as you think about resilience, um, how you think about government contracts and, and um, you know, the, the stability from that in terms of growth. I don't know who wants to jump in on that. Together, Dennis, thank you. Well, just, just quickly, because there have been multiple streams of thought in the literature about this, you know, going my, way back, I think, to Kirsten Gronberg's work, where she challenged whether diversification was a good idea. And, and she sort of argued that, uh, you know, just latch on to that government revenue stream that you could find and, and hold on to it and you, you'll, you'll be better off in, in, in those terms. Um, but then we've seen a lot of volatility, volatility over time in, in, the, uh, in, in the government sector and, and serious cutbacks. And so uh, that, that would be a very vulnerable position uh, to be in, to just simply say, um, this is our revenue stream. Maybe it's right for some organizations, but you know, this is our revenue stream. We don't need anything else and we'll just ride this horse. Um, I think over the long term, that's that's uh, not a viable way to go about it. Now, um, you know, so how should you go about it? Well, in one of the previous slides, I think uh, it was either that or George, you know, threw in a, a picture of my previous book <laughs> uh, called Financing Nonprofits and, and Other Social Enterprises. And the, and the idea there is to diversify in a way that really makes sense for your mission. Okay, so you need to think about the, you know, the society wide benefits that you are producing that might be of uh, special value to government organizations that you engage with. Um, you also need to be thinking about uh, outputs that you're, you're offering where there's a private benefit involved and, and it might make sense to develop, uh, you know, an earned revenue stream so that those people, you know, coming to your, uh, your museum or your, uh, you know, your service agency uh, have some ability and willingness to pay. And so you're connecting to their individual benefits. Um, and you need to think about donor populations in the same way. What exactly are you doing of a kind of a, a, a you know a collective nature of particular interest to certain groups that would uh, you know lead them to want to support you. So this kind of rationale of connecting the the mission to the benefits that you're producing to um, you know who would be interested in supporting that and how you know is it through donations is it through fees is it through government contracts that's the kind of rationale that I try to you know develop in that previous book, which is also connected with the resilience uh, issue, because I think, um, I think diversification is important, but not diversification for diversification's sake, as mm -hmm. Dad was saying, but in a, in a sensible, customized way that makes sense for your organization. Yeah, absolutely, Dennis. I know the entrepreneurial mindset is important, right? And a lot of times entrepreneurs say do one thing well and then scale and grow from there. I think that's an important um, component, which I appreciate the the focus on um, when you're on your revenue, like, you know, make sure you're doing that one stream really well um, before you're ready to diversify. Thad, do you have a comment on that as well? The other issue with government funding, which um, um, is, is sort of about forecasting how you think government budgets will look over the next few years. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is historical um, um, basis to assume that there will be some problems with government funders going forward. 
And, um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that government funding, if you rely on it, will be cut or that it will be scaled back, but it may not grow the way that your costs grow, and yet you'll still be responsible for providing those services. And there's also precedent that some states, such as Illinois and New York, um, when dealing with their own budget problems, have sus suspended payments to um, nonprofit providers. So again, it's not that you would necessarily lose your revenue, but now you have to come up with some sort of cash flow technique uh, mm -hmm. to deal with the fact that you can't collect on what is owed to you. Um, so again, it, this is not to double down on the um, get rid of government funds if you have them, but to, to Dennis's point of resiliency, be aware of the risks. And some of the risks are that um, they may not keep up with cost increases in the future, and there may be uh, cash flow concerns with those revenue sources. It's an amazing point that to, to be, think critically about it. I know also another thing I pulled out of your one of your research papers is that in Oregon, nonprofits with overhead rates exceeding 70 percent um, disqualified from tax exempt status, which is, you know, again, in a lot of ways, incredibly frustrating because you're saying if well, let's take a couple years, invest in the team, invest in the growth. And then meanwhile, the state is saying, no, can't do that. Um, so I guess my que the question is around this, which is something that someone put into the chat is, how do we as nonprofit providers uh, practically take like the next steps to uh, transforming this conversation? Of course, share this conversation with our board members and friends and begin this socialization, but what advice do you have for our providers? Uh, there's one thing I, I often see, I study international NGOs as well as uh, nonprofit organizations in the US, and many, many nonprofit and NGO practitioners are well aware of issues like the overhead starvation cycle and, and so forth, uh, and, and privately will um, describe how, how that's harming their organization specifically and their sector more broadly. And of course, you look at their website, and what do you see? But the overhead pie chart, and the you know seals of accreditation, and so forth, in, in the footer of the website. And uh, th there's this kind of sense in which organizations and managers themselves are are sort of complicit in the perpetuation of these norms that they know are holding them back in some respects. And I think that just go, goes to show you or to demonstrate the strength of these social norms in the sector, that even when we know that adhering to some of these norms might not be helpful and could even be harmful, that the pressure to adhere to them anyway is so powerful that we're, we're willing to accept these trade-offs uh, and, and to have inadequate resilience in some cases and to lay off staff and reduce program services when there's a recession and those services are needed most. And then to reacquire those at great cost later on, um, there, there's, I think, a need here to you know, build some kind of consensus. And I think uh, alliance organizations like yours and others throughout the nonprofit sector at the state level, at the national level, can help to shift the conversation a little bit. Uh, part of that, I think, is sharing stories uh, about these you know, normative financial management practices and how they're creating challenges and helping supporters and other stakeholders understand the real world implications and trade-offs and dilemmas that managers have to confront. And there shouldn't be these trade-offs. Whatever norms we have in the sector should be supporting mission impact and not getting in the way. And I don't think that message has really gotten out kind of beyond, um, leadership teams and, and managers, even managers and leaders might be reluctant to speak to their boards about some of these concerns because they don't want to create an impression that they're, uh, you know, not exercising good financial stewardship and, and so forth. Uh, so I, I think discussions like this are important and, and anything we can do as a sector to, to share some of these stories can help change the conversation a little bit. Got yeah, Dennis. Yeah, I mean, I, well, two ideas. One is um, partially we may have a language problem because when we say overhead, and I'm I, I'm not an accountant, I'm more of an economist, 
Um, but when we say overset, uh, overhead, it it's just sounds like a bad thing. It sounds like a lead weight that, you know, resources that we have that, that aren't productive somehow, they just kind of, they're there and we have to cover them. Whereas, you know, we really need to think of them uh, overhead expenses or fundraising expenses, we need to think of them strategically. And an economist would say, think of it at the margin, you know, um, if you, what, what would be the implication of spending more, this is Dan Pilata's argument going way back, but he, he didn't put it in exactly these terms. Um, if you spent a little bit more on fundraising, um, but it, it made your ratio look bad, but it turned out that you raised all kinds of funds with that. Um, and uh, the point at which you would spend to maximize the net return on fundraising um, probably doesn't conform to some average rate that people are prescribing for what your fundraising ratio should be. So we have to kind of think about it like that. Now, with overhead, it's kind of, a, it's more generally, it's, it's a little bit more, uh, um, abstract, because what you really want to talk about is, you know, if we invest more, a little bit more in management infrastructure or in, an, in a new building or something like that, what are we going to get from it in terms of mission impact, you know, in terms of the, the, the return that you're going, going to get? So the ratio doesn't mean that much, but you need to justify the, the expenses uh, on what's being called overhead uh, change, you know, maybe even change the language to say, what exactly is that in terms of the items that we're spending on? And, you know, and, and demonstrate that there's going to be a net benefit uh, to doing that. Uh, and, it, you know, it goes in the reverse direction too. Maybe, maybe you're, you're, you know, you're spending on, uh, on management infrastructure is, is too big. <laughs> And if you cut back a little bit, you'd, you'd be better. I mean, that's possible too. The idea of the, of the margin is to think incrementally from where you are, a little bit more, a little bit less, a little bit more to, to where you would get to the point of doing absolutely the most that you possibly could to be effective in addressing your mission. Another way of kind of thinking about this or rephrasing or reframing that conversation is, is to move away from, from this focus on overhead to a focus on cost effectiveness. Yeah. And, and, to, and to point out that real efficiency is, uh, you know, outcomes per dollar, impact per dollar, something like that. We, we have reasonably or relatively more sophisticated systems for measuring uh, financial activity and much less sophisticated systems for measuring mission activity. So on the form 990, it's all about your finances and you can calculate ratios, but th there's very little systematic communication about what are your activities and your goals and your accomplishments in relation to that spending. So can you account for, with a certain amount of money, we achieved these results. And you can see sometimes organizations have reach numbers or we can, uh, you know, per person helped, it costs us this much money and, and things like that. Those can be very complicated to do and acquire very strong data systems and program evaluation capabilities. But if you have that kind of information available and those systems available to produce that information, what a great way to reframe that discussion from, so what if our overhead ratio is this or that, or we have this or that reserves, you can't buy these services more cost-effectively from anywhere else in the country today. And we have the evaluations to back up how efficient we are. And that, that's, I think, a much more persuasive uh, way to talk about financial management uh, than you know, cost ratios and things like this, which we know are problematic. But it does require having that program valuation capacity and having those systems in place to gather data and, and being able to benchmark. And, and the whole sector, I think, you know, I can't speak to the veteran sector specifically, but it's not a, a strength necessarily of the sector today uh, in terms of those systems for program evaluation as compared to what we have for, uh, you know, financial reporting. It's an ongoing challenge for us. Deb, do you have any closing comments for our group? Um, no, I didn't. I, I was, I've been, I've been sitting here thinking of the other question that was, that was asked about ESG scores, um, because I've never actually thought about ESG scores, um, as they might affect nonprofits. Um, so I, I was, I was, I was, 
while, while George and Dennis were opining, and I agree 100% with everything they said, um, I, I, I was thinking about ESG. And the only thing I could come up with sort of off the cuff, and again, this is not deep thoughts by fad calibres. This is just what I sort of thought about. You know, ESG scores can, can you know, they're, they're, they, they could be applied to nonprofits directly as they have been um, in, in for-profit corporations. In that sense, ESG scores would be, you know, a compliance issue. Um, um, and, um, you know, then, you know, complying with an ESG score or, or something is just, it's another, it's sort of like a cost of regulation, right? So I could envision ESG scores for nonprofits could cause increases in costs. And, and to the extent that where you're located, if you want to issue debt through a public conduit, if, if, you're, if your state won't do business with certain banks, and so the, the pool of banks is smaller than, than in, in economic theory would dictate your cost of borrowing could be affected and go up. Um, I, I guess on the flip side is there might be donors who are drawn to, um, to fund organizations that have certain ESG scores. So while I think that there is going to be a cost of compliance if it applies to nonprofits, there could in theory also be revenues that are attached to complying um, with particular ESG scores. But that's my that's my thinking about it as a, that's a great question. I wish I had thought about it before I got on this call answer. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Adrian. It was a great question. I was trying to get to it. And I know we are at the top of the hour. And so I do want to thank our panelists for their time and for their research and for just um, starting to provoke this conversation as we think about how to effectively and efficiently run our organization so we can serve veterans and military families well. Um, what I took away from it, right, is that you need to do what's best for your organization while also considering how you can, you know, be a norm buster and consider taking on a little bit more risk or bucking the norms. But we always talk a lot about storytelling and being authentic. And I think it's important to be authentic with your needs at the time with your donors, investors and board. Um, and this all begins with a, a conversation around all of this. I know we look to our partners at Combined Arms to, to run their organizations well and to do it efficiently and effectively. And we are certainly committed to helping organizations and to you know, holding ourselves accountable to how we might be able to, to buck some of these transition, to buck some of these norms and to use our entrepreneurial mindset to, to run their organizations better. I mean, it is really important that we invest um, find ways to invest in ourselves so that we can continue to grow um, and serve and connect more veterans and military families to resources. So again, thank you for taking your time today. For Dennis, Thad, and George, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. We are grateful to each of you um, as we have lots more to, to contemplate and think through. And for the questions that we didn't get to, uh, we will follow up with each of you individually um, with some of the next steps. So again, thank you so much for taking the time and have a good rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.